If you want students who will be agents of change, teach local history. According to a recent Education Week Research Center poll, 78% of educators believe the primary purpose of teaching history is to prepare students to be active and informed citizens. An Ed Week editor went on to comment, therefore, we study and share history in part to give us the foundation for action. It appears that educators support this idea. The better we know the past, the better prepared we are for maintaining democracy while perhaps creating a better future. Taking action requires students who know how to be agents of change. But what part does place-based local history play in this preparation? Well, first, history teachers have to do what all teachers have to do. They have to get kids interested. In place-based education, students use local places as anchors for learning, whether it be science, literacy, art, or social studies. As a basis for learning, place is critical for history education. Place makes history real, it brings history alive, and by doing so, it makes history relevant. When we think about how to make local connections to national and global stories, the content is no longer distant or abstract. Students can see that history matters because the evidence is right in front of them. I'll give you an example. When the seventh and eighth graders at my school learned about World War II, we looked for local connections. One of the most significant stories of that era in our city, Portland, Oregon, is the incarceration of Japanese Americans into concentration camps. Their incarceration led to the dispossession of businesses and property and the erasure of Japantown in Portland. To bring this history to life, our classes collaborated with the Japanese American History Museum of Portland on a project. The museum needed a scale model of the assembly center in Portland, where people were held before being sent to camps in California and Idaho. Students studied the blueprints to create the model and also listened to hours of oral histories from people who had lived in the center in order to add details and create a written document to accompany the exhibit. To support the project, students also met with a panel of World War II vets from the retirement community down the street, hosted a Holocaust survivor in the classroom, and learned about the national and global story through film and text, including the historical novel On the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, set in Seattle's Japantown. Walking tours of historic Japantowns in both Portland and Seattle, as well as a visit to the Assembly Center site, established a direct link between the past and the present. In this example, many students also had family members who were in some way involved with World War II. Studying local history allows us to elevate and value the stories and experiences of students and their family. Place becomes the medium through which students make meaning of something that could otherwise feel totally irrelevant to their lives. Okay, so once you have them interested, the next step is to teach them the art of historical detection. This means tapping into their natural curiosity and training them how to ask questions, develop theories, and struggle with incomplete or conflicting information. What we like to call critical thinking skills and inquiry-based learning. What it doesn't mean is teaching based on a textbook or lectures. In my school, we teach the history of Portland, Oregon through the lens of the Black experience. In one of the first lessons, we look at recent demographics of major American cities. Students see that Portland is the whitest city in America. Why is that? It's certainly not random, and the answer has everything to do with history. Students go on to examine and interpret dozens of primary sources. They inspect the handwritten vote tally from Oregon's first constitutional convention that decided Oregon would outlaw both slavery as well as forbid free black citizens to live in the state. They explored deeds from houses in Portland that restricted home sales to members of the white race. They investigate a map from the 1950s that shows numerous jazz clubs within a thriving multiracial community in Portland before urban renewal initiatives tore down houses and displaced hundreds of families. Students examine this material all before they read one secondary source. They are also confronted with different interpretations of the same event. 
A newspaper article reported on a 1968 riot one way, while an oral history interview recounts the same protest from a very different perspective. The teacher, however, does not expect our students to know how to interpret primary sources without prior training. Before examining the dozens of sources that we explore in this unit, we make sure first that students know the difference between a primary and a secondary source. As an exercise, students tell a personal story to another student and the second student repeats it to a third. Who is the primary source in this example and who is the secondary? What is the difference between them? What can happen between the first telling and the second telling? Why? Learnings from this discussion are revisited later on. Next, we teach students the difference between an observation and an inference. Using photos from the Library of Congress, students practice reporting things they observe before they move on to making inferences based on these observations. In this way, we address how assumptions and background knowledge often informs and misinforms our understanding of a source, especially photographs. This step is critical for students to learn how to make claims based on evidence, a key component of thinking like a historian. As students grapple with primary sources and navigate multiple perspectives, in other words, do the work of historians, they see firsthand that history is fluid and complex. The work complicates their own understanding of history and debunks the idea of the single story. Their peaked curiosity and intellectual struggle ultimately will make them more invested in the story of their place. Their knowledge of local history also serves as scaffolding for comprehending the bigger picture. Portland's history is uniquely its own, but the story of discrimination and resistance within the Black community is not unique to Portland. It fits into a national narrative playing out across every state over the last 400 years in the US. Delving into the local story while also exploring the national history will ultimately lead students to identify patterns and relationships. They cultivate a deeper connection to their place as they also recognize its context within a larger story. Teaching the past requires that we also teach the present. This final critical step will be difficult to miss when exploring local history since many students may be familiar with current events in their cities and towns. As educators, we help students connect the dots between the past and the present. Students will see how history directly impacts people and places, and by extension, themselves. This helps them to see their own role in the story and the active part that they can play. My school can offer, offer a few examples of projects that fluidly connect the past and the present, culminating in action. After our third graders learn more about the indigenous peoples of our area, starting with current events and contextualized by historical and cultural studies, they propose that the administration adopt a land acknowledgement statement to read before school and public meetings. Students even composed possible drafts and presented them to the school board and the staff. As part of a unit on immigration, our seventh and eighth grade students partnered with an organization called the Mercado, a nonprofit that helps Latinx businesses get off the ground. The Mercado was planning its three year anniversary celebration and asked if our students would create a pop-up museum to teach the history of immigration policy in the US and Oregon. Another year, the immigration unit ended with students hosting a naturalization ceremony at our school. Students are naturally called to action when they learn to think like historians and when they are, are encouraged to see history as a dynamic relationship between the past and the present. History is no longer a fixed story, a list of facts to memorize. It is a living thing full of real people who made choices and often made mistakes. The collective choices and actions of all of these people brought us to where we are today where we are charged to make more choices and take action. As students build a sense of agency and begin to propose change, history will support their efforts. Learning about the past offers context and potentially a blueprint. Students will be more informed about the reasons behind public policy, city planning, and current events. They can look to the past 
to pass change makers, both local and national, for lessons and inspiration. By looking into our collective memory, they glean strategies and arguments. What worked? What didn't? Perhaps what supports student agency more than anything else is that local learning and local history deepens the relationship students have to the places where they live. Writer and environmental activist Wendell Berry said, we have the world to live in on the condition that we will take good care of it. And to take good care of it, we have to know it. And to know it and be willing to take care of it, we have to love it. Barry's words apply to all aspects of place, including the stories and histories we tell and discover. When students cultivate a deeper relationship with their place, they are also building a stronger desire to care for it, to advocate for it. All of the skills they practice as historians can be applied to advocacy, asking questions, investigating answers, and navigating multiple perspectives. Place-based history can happen at any school, not just small charters and private schools. And the benefits go beyond the students to revitalizing your connection as the teacher to the content and putting you in the position of learning alongside your students. The key is starting small. Most likely, the first step is doing some of your own learning, reading books or articles about local history, talking to folks at local library or archives, uh, going to the public university. If you do not feel like, you should not feel like you should start with a whole unit. You can even start with just a few primary or secondary sources, inviting in a guest speaker or two, um, or doing a trip to a museum or doing a walking tour. Another option for high school and middle school teachers is developing a local history elective that allows students to really act like historians and dive deep into one story. Over time, as your knowledge grows and you develop more community connections, your program will grow too. This is not a one year process, but a journey that could develop over the course of your career. And why? Why do all of this? Why not just teach textbook history like many of us were taught? It brings us back to the reason why so many of us teach in the first place, as demonstrated by the Education Week survey. One of our primary goals as history educators is to raise active and engaged citizens, ones who will be agents of change. The unspoken hope in this goal is our desire to nurture students who will do good in the world and who will fight for positive change in the places where we live. When we work to connect students to their local history, we invest in the future of our collective communities and in the possibilities of our students as leaders in that future. Thank you.